Thank you so much, Tazmin. Um, and welcome, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are dialing in from. Um, and welcome to our conversation um, on One Sky. Um, we'd really hope for this to be a um, dialogue conversation. Um, so if you have any questions or comments throughout this presentation, feel free to put them in the chat um, and or interrupt me as well. Um, we really want this to be an engaging conversation, um, not so much just a webinar of me talking at you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, give me one second. All right, you can all see my screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Sorry, oops. Okay, so um, before we get started, just want to give a big thank you to MUN Impact um, for the opportunity to share our work with your audience. We're really grateful and excited to talk about One Sky and how all of you can get involved as well. Um, my name is Annie Fromson Ho, and I am the Students for One Sky Volunteer Manager at One Sky. And I am joined today by my wonderful colleague Heather, um, who's the head of Global Philanthropy. And we're excited to get to talk to you about what One Sky is, what we do, um, and again, how you can get involved with our work. Um, before diving into our presentation really fast, um, we just would love to hear a little bit more about why you chose to join um, the One Sky webinar this morning. Um, so if you could just put one word or a phrase into the chat about what made you decide to tune in, um, that would be great. Okay, great. Well, thank you um, for sharing. Um, all right, so let's dive in. Um, as Tasmin briefly mentioned, um, One Sky for All Children was founded in 1998 by our founder, Jenny Bowen. Um, the story of One Sky, which was formerly known as Half the Sky Foundation, goes back to when Jenny and her husband adopted a daughter from China and after they adopted her, they noticed that she was despondent um, and just failing to thrive. Yet after the first year of showering their daughter with love, um, they witnessed a miraculous transformation in their daughter. Um, and she was healthy, active, and hitting all of her markers. And so with this transformation, Jenny asked herself the question, if I could do this for one child, why can't I do this for all children? And this inspired her to found um, Half the Sky Foundation. And since then, the organization has been working in Chinese institutions across China. Um, today, Half the Sky has become One Sky, a global NGO committed to training caregivers and communities to unlock the hidden potential in the millions of children that the world forgot. Before, while each of us um, have our own reasons for joining One Sky, so me and Heather both have very different paths that took us to One Sky for myself. Um, One Sky was more than just a desire to give back. Um, for me, it's a symbol of new opportunity um, and a symbol of giving back. Um, for me, I was one of these children, um, just like Jenny Bowen's daughter, living in an institution many, many years ago. And my path, um, both living in the Bay Area where One Sky's roots are, um, has taken me to volunteer with the organization on an orphanage build in 2007, to volunteer with children at the China Care Home in Beijing in 2018, and today as an undergraduate student, um, volunteering my time um, throughout uh, this past year and a half, um, supporting the students who are also as eager to give back. 
So for clarity, um, this is our One Sky uh, mission and vision. Our mission um, is to teach communities and caregivers to provide nurturing, responsive care and early childhood education that unlocks the vast hidden potential in our world's vulnerable children. And our vision is a time where every child receives nurturing, early care and education that enables them to reach their full potential. So you might be wondering, where does One Sky work? Today, we work in four different locations. We work in China, we work in the Hong Kong SAR, China, we work in Vietnam, and we also work in Mongolia. But for today's purposes, we'll be highlighting our operations in Vietnam um, and sharing a bit more about that later. Before that, we're gonna backtrack and talk a little bit more about um, the situation at hand and our One Sky methodology that informs all of our work across all the different locations. So the situation um, at hand um, is centered around the concept that um, the care children receive during their first 1,000 days can determine the trajectory of their entire lives. And so this um, fact, both scientifically um, backed, um, has been influenced, um, our work, shall I say, has been influenced by um, proven practices like the Reggio Emilia principle of child-centered learning informed by global evidence based on early childhood development and adapted to serve specific needs of children and their caregivers. So while our programs are all centered around the top two points, they're um, adapted to serve the specific needs of the communities in which we work. And at the core of our One Sky approach is responsive care. And at One Sky, we define responsive care as caregivers who are parents, grandparents, um, or caregivers um, who observe children and respond accordingly to their needs or interests. And this model um, not only builds trust and a solid bond between the child and the caregiver, but it also ensures that the child develops not only physically, but also thrives in the area of physical, social, emotional, cognitive, and language development. So with over 20 years of experience, um, One Sky's efforts to provide quality early childhood care and education to marginalized children has not gone unnoticed. We have received support and recognition from multiple organizations and foundations, including the Target Foundation, the IKEA Foundation, the Skoll Foundation, and the International Forum Design. Um, most recently, we were also selected for the 202100 um, Global Collection for, uh, for our work specifically in Vietnam on early childhood education. And for those of you who are mathematically inclined, here are our impact numbers most recently. To date, we have trained over 62,843 caregivers, directly reached 227,212 children, and indirectly reached 650,000 children. And this number continues to increase. So um, for the meat of our presentation, we'll be highlighting our work in Vietnam. For those of you who are wondering why um, we moved outside of China, um, it's mostly, um, well, generally speaking, shall I say, um, the child welfare landscape in China is changing. But One Sky recognizes that the need for quality early childhood development care and education exists far beyond the walls of an orphanage. And this has led us to expand both into Vietnam um, and Mongolia. So in Vietnam specifically, um, the need is greater than ever for early childhood education. Rapidly growing industrial zones um, continue to attract migrant workers and the zones are populated with migrant workers and their families. Of Vietnam's industrial zones, over 70% of the workers are women, many with young children. Um, and the families in this area, many cannot, over 75% um, cannot access quality childhood care. Um, so for those of us who are dialing in from the US, um, roughly 70% of shoe imports are from Vietnam. So it's very likely that many of us are wearing something that was made from the families that we directly serve. Um, also in Vietnam, while there is a home-based daycare industry, um, it does lack in quality. And so this is where One Sky enters. 
To support migrant workers in these areas, One Sky has, has partnered with the Vietnam government to improve the outcomes for children and families living in these areas. And um, our approach includes um, three different methods, uh, training for workforce, parent education, and care for children. Training for workforce involves um, our, again, evidence-based approach um, of the Reggio Emilia principle and uh, the Harvard Center for Developing Child. Um, we also, again, partner with government to allow for our, for our program to scale. Um, and specifically, the training involves um, what is in this kind of third wheel, um, three-part wheel over here, which involves 20 classroom trainings. Um, online learning through our digital platform, One Big Family, um, and bi-monthly visits to um, these homes. Um, and this is what we call a blended learning model. Um, we currently have a goal of scaling our programs to 19 provinces throughout Vietnam and to reach over 400,000 children. For parent education, um, our program is aimed to empower parents with tools to advance the development of their children at home and to allow parents to discern quality in daycare as an advocate on behalf of their children. A key part of this program is to involve parents, fathers in parenting, um, and it is often traditional for women to shoulder most, if not all, of the childcare responsibilities. And then um, finally, care for children. Um, if any of you have heard of our work in Vietnam, this is most likely um, what you've heard about, um, which is our early learning center in Da Nang, which serves 250 children of migrant workers every year. Our early learning center serves as a model of best practices, both nationally um, and as a training hub for our um, home-based care providers. Our center is also used as a community engagement spot um, and support. So um, we offer after work activities um, during the um, recent typhoon season. Um, our, our center was used as a shelter as well as providing support during the pandemic. Um, all of this goes to say that um, our work again is a proven practice um, over the course of a recent evaluation um, done by the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, our work has been found to improve and sustain home-based child care quality. So physical environment, child care, caregiver um, interactions, um, inclusiveness um, and support for early learning and development as well as improved child outcomes. So fine motor skills, um, visual perception, and early learning composite scores. Um, again, our work in Vietnam cannot be done without the partnership and direct collaboration with governments and local communities. Um, here at One Sky, we're really big about um, hiring locally and working directly with communities. So you might be wondering, this sounds really cool. How can I get involved as a student? Great question. So if you were to email our One Sky office, um, you would probably get in touch with me um, as I oversee the Students for One Sky program. The Students for One Sky program um, are students, youth, and families around the globe making a difference in the lives of young children in Asia. We have four pillars to our program. We stand up fundraise, speak up, and connect for all children. Um, this below is our um, website link if you would like to look at it um, after this presentation. Um, these are some of the groups that are involved in our Students for One Sky um, community, um, but this is not all of them as we always have individuals, um, families, and, and countless more students um, joining us um, every month. During the pandemic, um, you might be wondering how students for One Sky was operating. This is just some of the ways that some of our groups um, were operating. So many of our universities um, were hosting Zoom activities um, and doing virtual fundraising um, to support the children in our programs. Um, but it's also worth mentioning that our One Sky Global team has also held online book events um, with renowned authors such as Lisa C and Kevin Kwan, as well as cultural events for the Lunar New Year and the Dragon Boat Festival. 
For many of you, you may be wondering what volunteering with OneSky means or why it is important. Um, these are some of the um, statements that many of our volunteers um, have submitted to us. Um, so I'll leave this up for about 30 seconds. Okay, so in the past, um, we've also had um, summer volunteer trips to our China Care home in Beijing for high school students, but current circumstances make these trips impossible for the foreseeable future. Uh, with that said, there are many other ways for you to get involved with our work and to make a difference in the lives of the children that we serve without having to physically be present at our facilities. Um, these are some of the ways that you can get involved, um, but we're also always looking for new um, ideas for speakers and events. Um, however, sadly, most of our events will be held virtually for the foreseeable future. But then again, um, we've made it work for the past year and a half, so I'm sure um, we could find other ways as well for the future. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, so feel free to get in touch with us um, in the next um, few slides. We'll put up our contact information. Um, but for now, if you enjoyed learning about OneSky but still have some unanswered questions, we have the perfect opportunity for you. Um, so on September 15th, um, we are hosting a fireside chat with our OneSky CEO, Morgan Lance. Um, and this is a perfect opportunity for you to ask directly to our CEO any questions that you have about our work, where we work, um, both the past, present, and future. So if you're wondering uh, where is OneSky going in five years, feel free to ask that question um, and you'll get it answered during that, during that chat. Um, so this is the, the link um, is attached over here. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can ask Heather, um, who is on this call as well, or feel free to email her below. Um, so with that, um, we just want to thank you for tuning in, um, for sharing your comments. Um, and again, we'd love to hear from you. Our volunteers are really an integral part of helping OneSky run um, and to ensure that we can continue to do the work that we do. Um, and so we would love to have you join our OneSky community in any way um, that you can. Um, so thank you. And we are here to take questions either um, over video or, you know, over the camera, or if you want to put something in the chat as well. Hi, everyone. It's Lisa. I'm going to uh, turn on my camera here um, in, a, in a moment, as I'll show you. I'm, uh, I'm operating at only about 50% capacity. Uh, but I personally want to uh, thank um, Annie and Heather for being here. I have a pretty deep interest uh, in this particular organization. Um, before we, before I share that, the one thing I do want to share with participants, if, if you're, you're here and you're interested in this kind of work, is how does this relate back to MUN Impact? So MUN Impact has been having a series of conversations primarily with Annie about ways that our organization can partner and support One Sky. So what's the connection for us? Um, there are two SDGs in particular, right, that when, we, when we're looking and having partnership discussions, we're looking for um, ways in which partner organizations are kind of working to support the SDGs, and often organizations are kind of doing that work, but don't make that explicit connection. So for us, we're very interested in the role that One Sky is playing in, in issues of equity. So all children deserve homes, all children deserve education, all children deserve um, 
to, to, to live a life, um, you know, as, as a family so that they have pathways to opportunity. And a lot of that starts very, very um, young. Orphanages are not great places uh, to, to promote equity and, and a sense of family and belonging. And so one sky is playing a really important role. And so that's kind of an SDG 10-ish issue, but I think also importantly, SDG 4, which comes back to education, um, because, you know, a stable family is also really, really key to students getting a good start in life, and that includes um, educational opportunities as well. So that's the tie-in. And the reason I say that is if you would like to volunteer with one sky. Um, this is something that you can then log through 100k deeds or if you're in uh, North America through our interview partner, um, which is a service learning platform focused on the SDGs, um, because really you're working to support um, you know, some 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 important SDGs, four and ten in particular. So I just wanted to make that really clear um, to our participants. Um, I'm going to be really, really brave here. Um, I'm going to turn on my camera and my cat's attacking me. Um, I broke my arm last week. It's been a rough couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm not at my finest here, but I, Annie, we're, we're in the same time zone. So uh, we've been up, uh, all of us, quite early. Um, but I'm going to see if I can share two quick pictures because this is kind of crazy. This is why we network. This is the first picture I met of my daughter, who's from Ningdu, uh, which is a very small uh, uh, city in southern Jiangxi province. This was the first time uh, that I got to see my daughter. And actually, uh, uh, in chatting, Heather's daughter also comes from the same place, was born about two years later. Um, so in a country as huge and vast as China, to actually have our children come from the same very, very small orphanage, um, is really pretty amazing. Um, and just to show you how life turns on, this is my daughter now. She is now an undergrad at Korea University. She uh, left home a couple of weeks ago um, and something pulled her back to Asia, right? That sense of uh, wanting to really be immersed in an East Asian culture. So there she is leading the good university college life of which I am very, very jealous. So I just wanted to kind of share that, that you know, one of the reasons we do these summits is to make connections and networking. That's really important professionally and for you as students, um, but also just at a very personal level. Why are we here? Why do we care about these issues? It does get to the root of what UN Impact is all about. So if anything that I'm saying or One Sky is doing is of interest, stay engaged because there will be ways for you to volunteer and support this organization. It does align with MUN Impact. And personally, I just want to thank uh, the two of you ladies for being here. Uh, and I look forward to finding ways to, to make that connection uh, grow uh, in months ahead. So that's all I'm going to say, but sorry, proud mom. I just, I had to like insert that there. So there we go. Proud mom in Ningdu. I mean, that is a small world. <laughs> So if we don't have any questions, yeah. So if there aren't any other questions, um, Lisa, I will. I would want to share this with you, but it's also a good um, vignette for the rest of the group to hear that shows an impact of um, our work or the, the need for our work continuing in China and across other um, early child care settings as well is, um, uh, so as, she, as Lisa mentioned, I also have a daughter um, who was adopted from Ningdu, this small, small place um, in sort of southeastern China. And um, she's now 15, um, a sophomore in high school. And a few years ago, um, the two of us went back to China and we visited um, the orphanage. And um, it was it, it was rough. Um, you know, the, the situation was rough. The children were all, uh, most of them had pretty severe special needs. Um, and the, the head of the orphanage um, told, said to my, my daughter who was there um, that they did not need toys or any crayons or any, anything when we were going to the store. So we go to the store, I have an 11 year old daughter with me. She says, what can I do for these kids? Can I buy them some toys? And they said, what would they do with them? And, you know, and that just really, um, 
obviously they don't have a, a one sky program there, but that really hit home for, you know, an 11 year old as well as me, because there was a child there who, um, she was about five with down syndrome, super outgoing, cutest kid. And to think that they didn't understand that she could be learning to write her name and coloring and whatnot. So, um, and when I said to the, uh, to the director, um, you know, something about having one Sky come in and train their caregivers, he said, oh, we only have about 25 kids here. What does that matter? You know, so it goes to show that these are still the attitudes in a lot of these places that it's just a child. Meanwhile, all of the research shows that those those first five years are the most critical. And um, it is as simple as Jenny Bowen's um, vision in the beginning, which is like that girl, she just needed crayons and a doll. And, you know, and here we are that this this the head of the orphanage didn't um, think to do that. So at the at the very base, like our work is. It, it comes down to that. We wanna see the, we see the potential in every child and we know why every kid needs a crayon and a toy and an, and a loving adult in their life. That was my Ningdu experience, Lisa. Yeah, mine was a little different. My daughter was four uh, when we went back and uh, it, it's not an easy place to, to get to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I was struck with um, was however, the staff at at a lot of you know a, a lot of places where children are institutionalized this is probably you know across the board right that early child knowledge of early childhood education and some of those early things that they that young children and, and babies and infants need is often lacking but the the love is there um and my 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 recollection is pulling up in front of that orphanage with a huge banner, welcome back home, Ning Fu Hua, which was her name, her, her Chinese name, with a string of firecrackers and the entire orphanage staff who came out, including the woman uh, who had found her uh, the morning that she was abandoned. So um, the love is there, but sometimes that knowledge and education are, are not there. And that's why if you're listening to this and you're interested in education or equity or children, um, being involved in an organization like this is great. It's great for you um, to, to learn about kind of the larger issues into which these children find themselves, uh, but then also, you know, what, what, what you can do um, as well. The blessing for I think Heather and myself is Ningdu was a small orphanage where um, there were not a lot of children. My my eldest daughter uh, was at an orphanage during a census year in the middle of a drought where farmers were abandoning um, uh, children in very large numbers because they could not pay off the population police. Right? They 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 couldn't pay the bribes um, and there was a huge spike. And that was a situation where there were two children to a bed, um, to a crib, um, and not a lot of social interaction because there wasn't enough staff. So um, it's, uh, it's humbling, right, to have a child who kind of has, has had their origins in that, uh, from, from that kind of origin. But uh, I'm hoping if you're listening to this, you probably, some of you probably have your own experiences with this as well. Um, I would love to have you, I don't know, be part of the solution. One other thing I will just say, one other shout out, because I've been following, One Sky used to be called Half the Sky. So I've been following this organization for about 20 years. And I, I want to give a really critical shout out to this organization, because the idea of One Sky and the family and the group homes and kind of foster care, that really did not exist. And the founder of One Sky and the, the organization of One Sky have been absolutely critical in working with the Chinese government to get them to think about how to take care of institutionalized children in a different way. Um, as Heather shows, that's not universally applied throughout China, but compared to where China was 20 years ago, it's like a different planet. It's night and day. And this organization really deserves a tremendous amount of credit for helping create that change um, at the policy level because it has impacted literally tens of thousands of children. So if you ever think that being part of an organization doesn't really matter, your voice doesn't matter, this is a really uh, an example 
where your voice matters and being involved in critical organizations really do matter. So that's my soapbox speech, but you guys are the best and I love <laughs> you for all the work that you've done. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I don't know that we um, touched on that in the um, in the presentation on um, what you're referring to. It's um, it's a called the Loving Families program, which is really like a foster care program. And um, it is really innovative in that um, parents are recruited from the local community. So typically they have had one child and they have raised that child already. And then they are hired um, to be foster parents to up to four or five special needs children. They live in an apartment that's provided to them that's adjacent to the orphanage. And so it gives the children that home-like care. So the child will go into the um, one Sky preschool during the day that's at the, at the orphanage. But then at, at night they come home and they have a family dinner and they have siblings and um, the outcomes there have been nothing short of remarkable in that the children who have been chosen to go into the foster families um, were often deemed unadoptable um, because of their needs. And um, you know, after a year of living with a loving family, um, these children are thriving and they are being adopted into permanent families. Um, locally and internationally. So it is a model that's getting a lot of attention and will hopefully, um, you know, we something that we will help spread to, um, to other locations as well. So it's a sense we're jumping into the Q&A session or you can turn on the videos and you can type down your questions in the chat for our presenters and they would be happy to answer them. So we have a question from Maria joining us from Ukraine. So she said that, um, is there any possibility for us to volunteer internationally as her school and her town at large does not have any student organizations? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have students from across the globe who volunteer with us. Uh, we're not limited to borders or countries or anything like that. We welcome anyone. Um, however small or large you want to volunteer, it's really up to you. Um, so if you would like to get involved um, and you live internationally, we, we are welcome to you. Um, and I invite you to get in touch with me. Um, through my email, which maybe you all should have somewhere in the chat. Um, if not, just send me a message um, and I'll put it in again. Um, and we can find a time to talk um, and I'll share kind of different ways that you can get involved. But yeah, gen just generally speaking, anyone is welcome. Um, there's no limitations to who can volunteer. Thank you. So this kind of answers our second question from Fatima joining us from UAE. She said, is there any age limit when it comes to getting involved with OneSky? Again, no. Uh, we welcome anyone of all ages. We've had children at the age of like five doing, doing lemonade stand fundraisers for us. Um, we have um, families of all sizes, shapes, um, backgrounds, everything. Um, and there's no limit on any qualifications to volunteer with us. Um, we're really a welcoming um, and accepting organization. And we love to make our volunteer base much more diverse. Um, so please get in touch if you'd like to get involved or learn more. Lisa also just shared with me that her own daughter um, did um, an international baccalaureate project in fifth grade. So she was probably about 10 or 11. Um, that's how she got involved in OneSky. Her daughter at, at that age was raising money for us. So, um, nope. Oh, she sold friendship bracelets I'm seeing in the chat now. Ah, oh, very cool. Yes. So um, there isn't, um, you know, sometimes people will have a first birthday party and then say, don't bring, you know, you don't need to bring gifts. Instead, I'd like you to um, donate here. Okay, so we have a question from Rita from Portugal. So what has been the biggest accomplishment as an organization so far? Mm. Heather, you want to take that question? Sure. Um, the biggest accomplishment as an organization so far. Um, 
I think Erin, I'm sorry, Lisa um, was speaking to that when she said our work at the government level and that um, the One Sky practices um, became the standard of care for all institutions across China. So that is really when um, we knew that, you know, um, our work was beyond, uh, you know, painting or fixing up an individual um, institution, but that we were working across, you know, making the systemic change. Um, and now the fact that the um, Vietnam government has invited us in um, several years ago based on the work that we did in China to help um, specifically with the children of the factory workers. Um, that's also, you know, that is a huge accomplishment um, for us because it's showing that, that the other, another country has asked us to partner and the same in Mongolia. Um, now they're asking us to help with the children who are living um, near Ulaanbaatar who have moved from the steppes, um, largely due to climate change, um, where they can no longer farm. So now the families are moving um, into the Gare districts around the city, and there aren't enough um, resources for the children there. That's great. So we have another question from Sara, who's a member of our press team. So she wants to know, has the pandemic affected your organization or like has it redefined volunteering for you in any way? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic's affected everything and everyone in every corner as we can all attest, right? Um, so um, there's big and small ways. Um, it, you know, the needs, you know, there are different needs, like, we needed to get PPE and help them get, you know, so for our trainers that, you know, hope that they could have appropriate um, protection against COVID. Um, it has, you know, the, our, a lot of our trainers were then living in orphanages for weeks at a time so that they wouldn't leave and, um, you know, risk reinfection in the community and coming back. It's changed practices. Um, some of them have been um, beneficial in that, like in Vietnam, we, it, as many as we can all attest to how many things pivoted to online. Um, so we have been able to continue training for our home-based daycare providers, but it went to an online platform, which, um, you know, was really, um, people were very skeptical if that would work prior to the pandemic, but that's what we had, that's what we had to do. So yes, I mean, it in every way that we're all being affected um, by it. And, um, you know, and it has affected fundraising. Um, you know, there are just needs everywhere now and in everyone's backyard. So <laughs> um, some of that has uh, shifted too. So we've had to wrap up our fundraising campaigns. That's it. I would like everyone to turn on the videos if possible and keep on sending questions in the chat. I think Ray, who's joining us from Kuwait, has some things to add on. So Ray, you can go right ahead. Yeah, for sure. Um, so first off, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, and I personally work with a few programs here at MU Impact, including uh, the SDG hubs, which what we do there is we basically um, help students try to develop their own projects um, working toward the SDGs. And I personally feel like that really ties together with also the work that One Sky does. And I personally, I'm really passionate about um, SDG4 and quality education. So thank you a lot for that. Um, just a quick question, since we work with SDG hubs and we're looking on um, perhaps uh, relaunching that or maybe expanding that in the future, um, what are some ways maybe you think One Sky and, and SDG hubs could coordinate on and collaborate? I will not pretend to know enough about SDG hubs to comment, but I'm I'm happy to you know follow up with you or and or Annie if you have a better frame of reference. Um, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, in one of my previous conversations um, with one of um, the other MUN, um, I think ambassadors. Um, we did briefly mention the topic of SDG hubs did come up um, and specifically through the lens of um, 
demonstrating one sky's work in Vietnam. So basically what we presented on today um, is kind of an exemplary model of an organization that's working to further the goals of SDG 4.2, specifically early childhood education, uh, but also generally SDG 4. Um, and so that during that conversation, uh, we didn't specifically nail down um, exact ways to to collaborate through that specific lens, but um, it's definitely on the table for discussion. So would be happy to schedule a time with you um, or anyone else who's involved in that SDG um, hubs coordination uh, to talk further about that. Um, so definitely we'd be interested in in following up. Yeah, and if I could interject for some of our students maybe who are new who don't know kind of what our SDG hubs are. So we kind of started this informally last year. Um, students who wanted to work on certain projects related to particular SDGs, and so SDG 4 is a big one, and that's what Ray is uh, referring to. Um, so uh, the thought is in this upcoming school year is every other month we have something called Global Weeks of Action, and I think, Ray, we discuss it, it's probably going to be December, uh, will be a Global Week of Action focused on SDG 10, which is equity, but we're going to tie in education to that. So from an MUN impact standpoint, if you want to be involved in, you know, learning about these particular SDGs and then creating the conversations and action campaigns that support these, this is where then working with a group like OneSky becomes really important so um, we can find creative ways to support their work. So um, there's kind of two ways you can you can volunteer directly with OneSky and they can creatively figure out how to get you involved to support their work, but then also from an MUN impact standpoint, how can you be involved with um, the SDG hubs or Global Weeks of Action? Uh, and then work to kind of pull one sky in and share information within our community. So they're kind of two different ways. Uh, follow social media and reach out to people. And Ray would be a great point of contact for um, interest here within MUN Impact if you're interested. Okay, thank you so much. If any of you have more questions, feel free to put them down in the chat. So the presenters can answer them. I just had a really quick question. Where, where are you right now with your um, program in Mongolia? And what does what does that look like? I knew about Vietnam, but not Mongolia. That sounds pretty awesome. So, what is the question? What's the? I I heard you mention that you're working in Mongolia. Right. So, what what? I mean, obviously, the program is still quite small, but like, how how did that come about? And I don't. We don't often. You're yeah. you're in a room full of like. <laughs> like geography nerds. So it's like Mongolia. Wow, that's really cool, right? I know it is and really cool. And it's not something we hear a lot about. So how did that interaction and that connection um, come about? And where are you in the development of that program? So um, we never go anywhere. We're not invited. So um, we, you know, we work with the government. Um, we COVID has really been disruptive to our plans to get that going because it started right. We were like really building the program um, at the at the when COVID hit. Um, we do have staff. We have a family center um, in a village where it's to help train parents and caregivers. Um, unfortunately, it feels like it would open for a couple of weeks and then there would be a COVID outbreak and then it would you know, but. Um, but we, the infrastructure is there. We do have funding um, and we do have staff. Um, our first work there um, included going into the state-run nurseries where children were often sent um, for malnourishment actually. And so the children would be, would spend, you know, several weeks there I mean, really getting fattened up. I mean, truly. Um, and then we came in and said, well, while they're here, you know, there are some other things you could be doing with the children. So that was how we started in Mongolia. And now we're, um, you know, taking our family um, center model 
there. Um, hopefully soon enough, we'll be fully operating um, and training um, the families and caregivers there with the ultimate hope of, you know, we look at things like helping um, local business women, or actually they're probably not yet business women, local women um, start a kindergarten in their year, you know, things like that, um, that would be trained by us. So, um, you know, we're looking at a lot of different possibilities there. They're very receptive to the work, um, a lot of need. Um, we just need, we need to get officially post pandemic. <laughs> But yeah, it is, it's really interesting, but yeah, we were, we were asked, we were specifically asked to help um, with some of these issues. And I love geography nerds too, Lisa. There are a lot of us here at MU and Impact who love our geography, so. Yeah. Um, ad, admin, I'm going to turn it back over to you as we kind of wrap up. Um, and again, for people who are listening, do check the chat because we've dropped a lot of emails. Um, yeah, and we do need to wrap this up because we have another session we need to launch. But uh, admin, back over to you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. So thank you, everyone, for all your questions. We've dropped down the website link for One Sky for All as well as the social media. If you want, we can send those again. And you have Annie's email. So if you have any further questions or you want to know more about how you can get involved with them, you can definitely email her. I'm sending a link for the help desk, which is basically you can just um, hop onto that Zoom call. And we have our student leaders from different MUN programs. And they can answer any questions you have regarding the summit or regarding any programs that um, uni currently has. And we have a message from Man at Home, I'm quickly gonna send it out. Man at Home is also a program run by Man Impact. It is a four week initiative for like high school students where they can get to know more about how to man. Like experienced students can sign up as mentors and lead their cohorts. So that was it, unless um, the presenters have anything else to add. And I'm also sharing the link for the social hour, which is there at the end of the summit. So we would really, love all of you to join as that's kind of like the session we have where you all can like socialize with each other so yes annie heather you guys have anything to add on no we don't uh, just again thank you all for your questions and for tuning in um, we look forward to connecting with some of you um, and hopefully seeing some of you at um, our fireside chat um, in about two weeks yeah, please join that if you can. Um, and when you um, go to the landing page on our website, there is an option um, for submitting a written question via form, or you can um, record yourself asking a question um, video and um, have it presented to the CEO. So I hope you will um, you'll submit your questions. Yes. And before we end the session, I would quickly like to take a screenshot for this session. So if you're all comfortable enough, kindly turn on your videos. And I'll just quickly take a screenshot so everyone can give the best poses that we have. So everyone ready? Okay. I'm going to take one more. Thank you so much to our presenters and our participants for joining this session. As Ms. Martin said, it would be posted later on YouTube, so you can definitely check back onto this. And we hope you have a great summit and you tune in for more sessions as we have very exciting stuff coming up. So thank you so much for joining. You're all free to leave now. Bye, guys. Bye, guys, everyone, and thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sanskriti. Thank you. Quick question, Cody. If I stop the recording, it will get saved on the Money Impacts account, right? Okay, thank you. Just click the leave and close button and it'll all be good. You want me to end meeting for all, right? Yes, please. Thank you.